I'm trying to live forever. Aging is a disease, so you can combat aging. In the next decade, the strides we are making on the human longevity path is going to allow us to be healthy and youthful for 150, 200 years. Brian Johnson, he's taking like 100 pills a day. He's plant-based. He's doing like all these experiments on his body. He did whatever his yeah. body's age was. And it came out to be like 18 years old when he's really like in his 50s. If I went to your car, and I tried to put yellow six in your car. You'd beat me up or call the police. But we put bad fuel in our bodies every day and we don't move our bodies. And so we feel lousy, we sleep lousy, and therefore, how do we perform? Our minds are foggy, we have aches and pains. How can I help more people avoid the biggest things that are plaguing us, right? Heart disease, stroke, obesity, cancer, diabetes. And the science shows 80% of these things are avoidable or preventable with What's up, Wealth Builders? Today, I have got a serial entrepreneur. This guy has sold over 400 Everbull franchises. Not only has he done that, but he started other companies that build franchises for other people like Shaq. He has sold um, digital marketing firms, HR companies, uh, eight figures plus exits. And uh, man, I'm just happy to have this guy on the show. What's up, Jeff Finister? What's up, Ryan? How are you, man? Good to see you, man. Thanks Good for coming out. Thanks for having me. Cool yeah. studio, cool office. Yeah, dude. So you've done a lot in the entrepreneurial world. Um, right now, to me, it sounds like your focus is uh, your franchise Everbowl, right? You guys have sold over 400 of them. We've got, I think, 70 plus of them opened right now. What What is Everbowl? Everbowl is a craft superfood chain. So said better, acai bowls, pitaya bowls, anything superfood in a bowl. Okay. And the idea being that in America, we don't eat healthy anymore. Right. We've lost the idea. People struggle with health and wellness. Yeah. And they struggle for two reasons. They're not moving their body and they're not eating real food. And so I looked at that problem, health and wellness is a passion of mine. And so when I was kind of sitting around figuring out what I wanted to do when I grew up, um, it was how can I help more people avoid the biggest things that are plaguing us, right? Heart disease, stroke, obesity, cancer, diabetes, hypertension. And the science shows 80% of these things are avoidable or preventable with lifestyle. Got it. And so I said, okay, well, I'm not a fitness guru. I'm not going to teach you how to work out. And you can't outwork a bad diet no, no matter how much you work out. Yeah. And we eat three times a day. And the average American eats fast food 3.2 times a week. Hmm. And you just keep reading all these stats. You're like, well, why are we not helping more people eat healthy? And so it came down to four excuses that people make why they don't eat healthy. It either costs too much. It doesn't taste good. Mm -hmm. It doesn't leave them full and satisfied or they just can't get it. And so I started Everbowl to be affordable, filling, delicious, and accessible and address that problem head on. Okay. So with Everbowl, I mean, you got these acai bowls and everything. Is our... Are you like a proponent of vegan and raw or anything? Like, okay. No, I eat meat. Um, I eat fish. Yeah. I eat cooked stuff. Okay. I, it's not a matter of, I don't believe in diet. Okay. I believe in eating better more often so I have less room for bad. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the secrets that people are trying to do all or nothing. Big things like, I'm going to go run a marathon. And then they've been sitting on the couch for eight years. Yeah, let's just get some sprints in first. Yeah, yeah. win the day. Win yeah. stack, micro goals. How do we Kaizen our way there? And so it's fill yourself up with quality nutrition. And so when you look at superfoods, acai bowls and all this, it's high in antioxidants. It's high in nutritional value. It's delicious. And it makes you stay young, look good. So yeah, will I go eat a cheeseburger with you? Of course. Okay. But I'm going to try to eat less cheeseburgers this week. And I'm going to try to eat a little bit more fruits, nuts, seeds, plants, you know, things that we know increase longevity, prolong better youthfulness and make me a better version of myself. Yeah. You know, it's so funny about that. And you know, this isn't to go down the road of health and wellness, but it's funny because I've had guys who are, are vegan on the show. I've had guys like liver King and Gary Brecca from 10 X who are the opposite of vegan. They're just like pure carnival. And they think that, um, veggies are poison. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> every time I look at it, I, I eat a balanced diet. You know, I'll eat veggies. I eat beef, I eat fish, raw. I just like good, good, healthy food. And um, it's just funny because like, I still don't know who's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you, I could never not eat meat. That, that much I know. Mm -hmm. There's only one thing that I believe for sure, at least with health and wellness, is that you got to eat a gram of protein per body weight. That's yeah. the only thing I know for sure. I mean, mm -hmm. there is no right or wrong. Because yeah. the truth is, when you look in the human anatomy and, and everyone's bodies is, are different. Yeah. Yes. People who are vegan, B12 is something we all need and you can't get it except from animal products. Okay. So they take supplements. Well, I don't think any diet that requires me to supplement my diet is the right diet for my body. Right. And when you look at our teeth, 
we have both the type of teeth that eat plants and the type of teeth that eat animal products. Right. So physiologically, we're supposed to eat both. Yeah. So whether you're vegan, uh, you know, you're um, the uh, avocado king or I think that's his name. There's an avocado king. There's a, avocado. I didn't know. I got to get there's that a, there's guy. A vegan I got to get guy. the avocado king. Yeah, on. there's a avo- there's a vegan guy. I think it's avocado <laughs> I know, a guy. king. Um, or it's the liver king. Yep. They're just being extremists. Yeah. And there's not re- extreme extremism is never a great thing. Right. I mean, truthfully, balance some form of balance. Now, Tim Grover will say balance is is garbage and it's the antithesis of, of success. Yeah. But it's it's balance in the scope of what's right for you. Right. Right. And mm-hmm. so I think eating plants is important. I think eating protein is important. I think yeah. eating animal products is important. But it's what's good for my cardio, you know, health, yeah. longevity. And the science there, I mean, when you look at all the scientists that are actually studying this thing at the molecular level, uh-huh. they always come down to eat more plant-based and eat less food. And those are the two secrets to longevity. Eat less food. Eat less food. Yeah. People, uh, they think they're going to die if they miss a meal. Correct. <laughs> it's just like, you know, I do a three to five day fast every quarter. Do you really? Yeah. Nothing. Just pure water. For three to five days. Yeah. That's tough. And I feel fine. I literally come into work and I film podcasts and chill. Nobody even knows I'm on a fast. Day one's not hard for you? I'm used to it now. I've okay. been doing it. So like when, like basically I do it for spiritual reasons. So I do it um, just because like in the Bible, they set the example of fasting. And, you know, it, it the Bible clearly tells us, hey, you should fast. You should restrain from food. And instead of eating, devote that time to prayer and all these things. And so I do that every quarter. And it's like during that time, I do it at the start of every quarter. And it's during that time I start to like make my quarterly plans and everything else. And it's, you know, beyond the spiritual side, it's a, it's a really good, to your point, health reset. You know, if you just look at the science of fasting, it's like, man, you, you get rid of like all these toxins. It like eliminates cancer cells. There's like so much that goes into it. Well, when, Cause when you are in a fasted state, your body can go attack the other things that are going wrong versus putting all those resources to digestion. Yep. I do intermittent fasting every day. Every day. I've okay. never done three to five days of fasting. Dude, you could do it. I, I it's think I could. You could. How do you decide between three and five? Um, well, I try to really get at least one five day in a year. And actually, I'm going to try and do a week next year. Um, I want to really keep pushing myself every year to see how long. Because like, I have friends who have done 40 days. So it's possible. Zero calories. For Zero four. calories. Do you drink Just coffee? Water. No coffee during it. Do you not get massive headaches? Um, I would say after like two days, you're fine. You, you just get used to it. Your body's already like going through so much. The last thing it's thinking about is like the coffee you're missing. It's just like, yeah, I'm missing everything. This is, but if you just eat normal and you stop drinking coffee for like a few days, you're like, dude, I have a headache. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's kind of like your concerns are so much elsewhere that you don't even realize that's happening. Well, I'm trying to live forever. Okay. That's one of my life goals. Okay. Um, I think that science is going to create the opportunity for us to live to be 150, 200 years in the next couple of decades. Okay. Um, they're making tremendous strides. As a guy who I follow, David Sinclair, he's the leading guy at Harvard. Uh, he's like the head of epidemiology and longevity at Harvard Institute or Harvard, not Harvard Institute, Harvard, the yep. university and the medical school. And he has this whole belief that in the next decade, the strides we are making on the human longevity path is going to allow us to be healthy and youthful for 150, 200 years. Mm. And disease and aging, aging is a disease. So you can combat aging. Mm. And I'm like, okay, well, why wouldn't I want to be on this planet for 150 to 200 years and see my great, great grandkids and be youthful and healthy? Obviously, I don't want to be in a terrible state yeah. doing it. I don't I want to be a healthy version, you know, and I turned 40. So you're at that midlife level and it's like kind yeah. of scary, you know, you're like, okay. Yeah. I've heard other people say that too. I mean- I don't research it enough to know, but I'm just like being the healthiest I can be, you know, with Mm -hmm. the the, the current resources I have and whatever. We'll see how it goes. That's right. So So that's why, that's why Everbull though. It was really just, I didn't need money. It was something I wanted to go after that was going to make purpose and impact. Yeah. And something that was meaningful to me. And so going back to your original question, I mean, that's what Everbull was built for, was for my own personal goal of helping do something positive in society, something I can get behind and help everyone be a better version of themselves. Cause all my other companies I've ever had, I couldn't tell you a hundred percent of the clients left better. Right. Might've made them more money, but did we make their lives better? Right. Did we really solve problems or were we just making a buck? And this one, every customer who leaves Everbull is a better version of themselves. 
Hey, if you're looking to grow your real estate investing business, whether you're just getting started trying to get your first deal or you're trying to scale and get to the next level, you need to join us at Wealthy Investor. We've got events every single quarter that are absolutely crazy. We've got online coaching programs where we have Zoom calls, a community every single week. We give you everything you need to know to start your business, scripts, processes, SOPs, all of it. It's for you so that you can dominate. So if you wanna learn more about how to join our community and be mentored by me and some of our top coaches and be around other students who are absolutely crushing it, go to WealthyInvestor.com, apply for a free call with my team. Once again, WealthyInvestor.com, apply for a call today. No, I feel you on that. So what's the, I guess, the end goal with Everbowl? I mean, you already sold 400 franchises. Is it to hit a certain number of sold franchises and exit? Is it to hold it like friggin' Chick-fil-A and have it forever? Like, what's the deal? I mean, I'm a serial entrepreneur. So the truth is I sell companies. I have investors. I want to get them a return. That's what I do. Yeah. Um, the mechanism with what I'm, what I build, the company's niche doesn't matter. So at the end of the day, yes, I want to build this thing for an exit. Okay. Make all my investors a lot of money and put it in the hands of someone who can take it to an even better level. Because yeah. I've identified where I'm really good. I'm really good as a startup serial entrepreneur. I'm not really good at an optimizing a billion dollar brand. I'm not going to go be the CEO of Facebook yeah. or Google. I mean, yeah, you want to start new stuff. I want to start new stuff. I have entrepreneurial ADD. I yeah. like the energy. I like the the thrill of starting things from scratch yeah. and figuring it out and building and scaling. So I hired a president, Trevor. He runs Everbolt today. And I'm going to sink my teeth into WeBuild. But ultimately, long term, the plan for Everbull is to put in the hands of someone who can take it into hopefully a billion dollar plus value and thousands of units all across the world and see this thing really take shape into what Everbull's meant to be, which is that trademark brand that we all say is synonymous with superfoods and health. Mm. So Everbull. Right now, would you say, and <laughs> I don't think their food's super healthy, but like Jamba Juice would be like the biggest. Jamba Juice or Tropical Smoothie Cafe. Oh yeah, Tropical Smoothie. And yep. Smoothie King. Those are like the three. But they're more all smoothie based. Everbowl's not like advertised as a smoothie company. Correct. And they were transitionary brands, right? So they are fast food-ish. Yeah. And syrup based and not real food, but a lot of chemical ridden. I know Jamba stuff. Juice. I've seen them like dump the sugar in. I'm like, doesn't fruit have sugar already? <laughs> like what, what's going on here? <laughs> I mean, I, I think they did a good thing though. They moved people across from where we were in the 80s and 90s where it was like fruit what's this yeah nah, give me ice cream right yeah and then it was frozen yogurt and then it was like smoothies yeah and then it was juices and now we're in the bowls and it's just the the progression what happens after bowls what's the it next ends at bowls <laughs> it ends at bowls then that the next best thing is people going to the supermarket and just eating an apple <laughs> that's like what it is yes so Okay. Do you, do you have like a certain number in mind that gets you to like that billion dollar valuation? How many stores got to be open? How does it work? About a thousand. A thousand. Tropical Smoothie Cafe, billion dollar value, thousand units. So that's opened. Opened. Yeah. Yeah. So for the viewers, many of them don't understand how franchising works. So let's talk about this step by step. So I walk up to you. I'm like, Jeff, I want to start an Everbowl. What's it cost? How does it work? Well, there's a lot of laws around franchising. Okay. So most brands have what's called FDDs, their franchise, franchise disclosure documents that basically is our lift up your shirt at the doctor and have a physical. It's yeah. providing that report to you. So if you were really interested, you would have to go to our website or any website, fill out the form and, and say, I want to be solicited to sell a to buy a franchise. Okay. I can't just be like, buy a franchise. Like I'm uh, selling timeshares. Okay. I'm not going to put you in the room and circle numbers around and keep scratching them off yeah. till we get there, right? Yeah. Um, but ultimately, the way franchising works is what's really good. I'll take a step back to get you there. What's really good about franchising in general is if you're an entrepreneur or you want to be a business owner, an entrepreneur, and you don't necessarily want to start from scratch and figure everything out and you want to be part of a community of other entrepreneur entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial minds that are building one thing towards a common goal, franchising is great. You yeah. can own a McDonald's. I can own a McDonald's. We get both our mind share, all four McDonald's. Yeah. And McDonald's did a really good job at that. Yeah. So that's why you'd want to do a franchise. So if you like superfoods and you're like, hey, I want to own an acai bowl chain. I want to be part of this thing. And I don't want to start, you know, Ryan's Bowls. I want to start, yeah. be a part of a community. Everbowl's a great option. Yeah. So for Everbowl, it's $30,000 franchise fee, uh -huh. which is your license fee to put our name on your door. Yep. And to get all of our SOPs, standard operating procedures, all the training manuals, all of our, you know, 
the stuff that makes Everbowl Everbowl, how we do what we do and why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you have to build one. So there's a physical, there's a cost to physically build it. Yep. And now you're open. And then there's a 6% royalty on every dollar sold, which allows us to continue to support you. Right. And that's marketing dollars, training dollars, coming up with new uh, limited LTOs and new initiatives and yeah. driving your costs down and helping you run your business from the corporate side. So to take a step back, you know, I had um, one of my students, I only have a few one-on-one students, but he's a guy who has franchises. And so he has 50 stores opened right now. And one thing he was saying on the show was that, and, and by the way, anyone can go watch that show with um, Ivan Flores. We'll link to it down below. But um, he was saying, he felt like selling franchises to more of like the, it, obviously like you're, you have like big people who have bought yours. So like you have Drew Brees who owns how many? 150. He owns 150. So like he's a different kind of breed. He's like, but when you're trying to sell to like a onesie, twosie mom and pop type person, he's like, you usually want somebody who's less entrepreneurial because they're going to actually just follow the thing that they're supposed to follow. Whereas entrepreneurs are like, well, we should do it this way, you know? And then we were just talking about the movie, the founder where, you know, these guys were like selling chicken and, <laughs> you know, stuff at McDonald's burritos and tacos. And they're like, what are you doing? I mean, he's right because in the absence of, but what's, what I've learned with, so I was never, when I started Everball, I was never going to franchise. Okay. That was never the plan. You asked me you day keep one. keep it all private. 100%. I self-funded them to start. Then I raised a little bit of capital. I had 28 of my own and COVID hit and things changed to franchise. But the day before I even knew what COVID was, you asked me and I was never franchising. Did, did you just franchise to raise capital essentially? What was the reason? No, um, growth. So I'm in California. We were very restrictive on March 18th, 2020. I shut down 28 stores and laid off over 400 people because yeah. nobody knew what was going on. May 1st, we reopened those 28 stores and started to come back to being real, uh, alive again. Yep. And through that process, just over the last four, you know, three and a half, four years, I had 500 franchise requests and I kept just ignoring them, putting them in a folder and never even responding, nothing. Yeah. Um, didn't have the word franchise on our website. Just, hey, are you franchising? And my private equity investor is one of the biggest franchise private equity firms in the world, Saruya Private Equity. And they're, you know, Kahala Brands, Global Franchise Group, Hot Dog on a Stick, Round Table Pizza. I mean, the brands are insane. And they've been in my ear for years. Franchise, 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 <laughs> franchise. I was like, no, 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 no. Well, when COVID hit and we could no longer travel freely and it was like, how are we going to grow now where there's all these weird states with different regulations and restrictions and we really need to grow right now. And there was an opportunity because businesses were kind of out and we're like, how do we really seize this? Franchising made sense. And mm. so we opened up our doors to franchise at that time. But going back to what Ivan was saying, what I've learned through franchising is if I don't give you an answer, entrepreneurs are going to make up their own. They're going to sell burritos at Everbowl because, hey, it's in a bowl. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where We got a burrito bowl. It's yeah, good. exactly. Uh, Non-entrepreneur minds won't do that. Right. They, they will follow the, the path. Yeah. They will. So I do like that better, but Everbowl gets better also through the mind share of entrepreneurs because you may come in as an entrepreneur and say, have you thought of, Yep. And that's tiring to, for my team. And I have to always remind them, guys, the Egg McMuffin was invented by a franchisee. The Big Mac was invented by a franchisee. It wasn't mm -hmm. all figured out by corporate. And why do we want to limit our thinking and not yeah. get the brain power of all these like-minded people who are helping push us to be better? Yep. No, he also said that too. He was like, your franchisees are going to be the ones who have the best ideas because mm -hmm. they're in their day-to-day, -day, like making it happen. Whereas you at the corporate level, you know, you're running corporate. And he's like, so... We're always listening to what they, they have to say. Yes. It's hard. Because most ideas suck. <laughs> that's the reality of life. you have life. to tell them that. And yeah. that's hard too. Yeah. Because no one wants to hear their ideas suck. I mean, I say it within my company. Like, I'm like, hey guys, like submit all your ideas. Like, I want to hear how we can get better. Now, also, don't be offended when we don't use it. Because guess what? Nine out of your 10 ideas are going to not be used. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you need you just stop submitting them and you're defeated. It's just, we can't do them all. <laughs> and nine out of ten of mine or your ideas aren't aren't yeah. great either. No, it's just not at all. We just don't have to maybe meet. eight out of ten for you. Yeah. I'm still nine out of ten. <laughs> I'm working towards eight out of ten. There we go. But yeah, most ideas suck. Yes, most ideas do suck. And the other main change of going from non franchise to franchise is when I was a non franchise brand, I was operating stores. Okay. As a franchisor, I'm a support company. It's yeah. a different. They're business different. Yeah, completely. you're not an operator anymore. You're customer 
service and support and just trying to help them win. You're like a coach. And my customer changed. My customer originally was you coming in to buy a bowl. Yeah. Now that's my franchisee's customer. My franchisee is my customer. Yep. And that's a different mindset. It's, It's difficult as a brand to always just make that pivot. Yep. So some brands just start franchising day one. Yeah. For us, it was a transition. Yeah. So you said that, you know, they pay the 30 grand, they have a 6% royalty. Are there other fees on top of the 6%? Uh, one to 2% global marketing fee. Yep. Which goes into us making stuff for everybody. Yeah. What I've just like, as I've researched franchises more because I'm looking at potentially, you know, being a part of a franchise um, on the corporate side, not as a franchisee. Um, I've been just like looking at people's... <laughs> uh, disclosure documents and their franchise fees and their, their, their royalties and their marketing fees. And it it seems pretty common for it to be around like 10% total with like the royalty and the marketing expense, essentially eight to 10. Yeah. We're right now we're at seven. Yeah. Total. Got it. So do you think there would be more benefit to you charging more on the marketing side? So you guys could really blow it up for everyone. Yes, because we're self-paying that. So we spend more. Yeah. I just come out of my corporate pocket. Yeah. The thing is, it's like all things. It's like being a teenager. You're too young to be small and too small to be big. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes you sound like a grown up and sometimes you realize you're still just a kid. Yeah. It's the issue with franchising. Until you get to scale of a couple hundred units, you're always going to kind of wish you had more resources. So where are you going to get them? Yeah. If I overcharge my franchisees, they open less stores. Right. So I'm robbing people. It's a people. balance. Yeah. Right. So I'm just like, you know what? We'll pay for it. We'll keep it low. I want you to grow and scale. You know, when we raised our franchise fees two years ago from 20 to 30, before we did, we went to all of our franchisees and said, who wants to buy more stores before we raise it? Yeah. And a bunch of them did. If I was charging more, maybe they had less resources to open more units. So which would you rather? Yeah. For you, it's more about getting units open than it is making an extra 10 grand. Of course, we're building a brand. Yeah. I'm not chasing dollars. Yeah. So they they now go into getting their their franchise built. Now, you also have a company called We Build. We Build. And you guys can build a franchise. And like that that was actually how we started talking. You're like, yeah, we can build a franchise um, in three days. I was like, three days? These guys are telling me it's like six months to <laughs> build this thing. How the heck can you build something in three days? So tell me about somebody who wants to open an Everbowl. Like, what are they typically going to pay? And what's the timeline of how it happens? So traditionally, if you but build a store like an Everbowl, it yep. cost you about 250 grand. Yep. For every bull, it costs half that, about 115 grand. Okay. And we build them. My team shows up on Monday. We leave on Friday. Your store's done. Mm. So three days of full build, part of Monday, hopefully and not And why is that possible? Because of how we build does what we do. We build most of the store offsite. Yep. And it's not modular based and it's actual brick and mortar retail store. You can go in and look at it. It looks like a real store. Yeah. Um, it is a real store. But we've re-engineered how you scale and grow these franchises. So my background is entrepreneurship. I like to start companies. And my first Everbull cost me 285000 to build. Okay. So you did it the traditional way. Traditional way. And I realized I want to go build 100 of these for myself. I was never franchising. Why does it cost $285,000 to build a smoothie bowl shop? Yeah. There's not much to it. I mean, and this isn't rocket science. We're not landing and we're not doing something that hasn't been done over and over and over again. Yeah. So I said, why is that happening? And I looked at, okay, there's a general contractor. He marks up everything. There's subs. They mark up everything. Yeah. And then they're one-offs. They've never done this before. They've done it twice. So they have to learn and you're fighting for other jobs. And it's like, okay, premium, 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 premium. What should cost 115 is costing me 285. Yeah. Well, why don't I just start my own company that builds only for myself? So I started We Build. We Build Stuff yep. to build just Everbulls. And it. it was, and what I did is, the guy who built my first one, Jake, I went to him and said, you want to be the head of WeBuild? <laughs> you know how to do it? And he's like, yeah. So I hired him to be the head of WeBuild. He joined my team and I started, We. I don't know how to build anything. I don't even put Legos together. There we go. I don't know anything about construction. I'm with you on that. Yes. My, my rule in my house for my kids has been, if it doesn't come assembled, my wife assembles it. <laughs> I, I don't assemble stuff. And WeBuild was built for that purpose. So it became 285 and it took us two months. Then it was 230 and it took us a month and a half. And we just kept getting better and better and better until now we realized we can pre-build 90% of the store because the guts are the same in every Everbowl, right? Yeah, My you signage, tables, you got signs. Yeah, it's the same. There's yeah. a few things that are custom, custom to the location, but overall, 90% of the guts is identical. And so WeBuild started putting what we call stores in a box. And now we're so good at what we do 
that we do it all ahead of time so that before you sign a lease as a franchisee, you know the exact penny it's going to cost. We have the exact floor plan. Mm -hmm. You sign that lease, you know exactly what it's going to cost and when it's going to be built. My team does it all. So the day we get access to your location and it's ready for we build to come in, it takes us three days. Mm, that's crazy. And so through that process was fun because I'm a big proponent in all my companies of vertical integration. That's how I've been able to grow and scale my businesses. I think it's the most important tool that an entrepreneur or business leader can start to think about. Mm -hmm. It's what I speak about on a lot of stages because it is so impactful. It can add multiple zeros to your business and give you multiple opportunities for exits as well as scale. Mm. And as entrepreneurs, that's what we're all thinking about. And so it also protects us and provides a moat around your business because take COVID. COVID hurt a lot of businesses. COVID was fantastic for me, not just because of franchising, but through that process, we build, got so good at building Everbulls that when I was actually pitching Shaquille O'Neal to buy, basically to start an Everbull, and he was very interested, and a year and a half later of going through the motions with Shaq and his team about why he should build an Everbull, and there's so many decision makers on the Shaquille O'Neal brand, um, ultimately it didn't work out because Shaq started his own concept called Big Chicken. Mm -hmm. And they didn't think it was a good idea at this time with him launching Big Chicken to then also now become a franchisee of another brand. Yeah. Shaq's involved with a lot of stuff. Yep. So fine. But Doesn't he have like a bunch of Papa John's or something? Papa John. I mean, Shaq. He's I love Shaq, but he's involved in like 152 brands. Yeah. I mean, he's the NASCAR. Yeah. You know, if he had to wear every brand, he'd look <laughs> like a NASCAR. He's good. He is good. And he's a big, big body. So he could, he could wear them all. Yep. Um, but they learned about WeBuild and the thought was, well, hey, we can't do Everbull right now, but could you help us with Big Chicken? Mm. And I was like, yeah, I'm sure I could. So we built a Big Chicken in my office. We did it in a week. We flew him down to San Diego. We put him in virtual reality. They, we blew their minds. And then they gave us an opportunity here in Vegas to build one of their Big Chickens. Mm. They said, you have a month and a half to do it. And it took us 14 days. And we now build all the big chickens. So we're actually in Washington right now, my team building big chicken while we're airing this. We just built one in Chicago mm. and we're working with their franchisees to now build big chickens. And so going back to we build and vertical integration, doing that created this whole new company we build and we build exploding and we're now doing big chicken. We're doing stretch zones. We're doing um, Capriotis and wing zone. And we're now working with 30, 40 other brands to start building for them. Mm. And it's so, going to turn into a big business. I mean, how, how would you say the build quality is compared to the the old method. I mean, is there better? It's better. Like this is true. We were actually told by Shaq's team, bring the quality down because it's we're built. They said the quality is higher than what we need. And so can we bring the quality down and lower the price? <laughs> and I said, we can lower the price. We can't lower the quality. The reason yeah. it's better is because we're doing it so many times. So think about it. Like if you decide to go build one playground set in your backyard, going to suck. Well, I built it. Well, let's just say you were good at building. It, <laughs> okay. And it was built really well. Yeah. You know what you're doing. You build it. You build one. It's great. How good would your 10th one be? It's going to be even better. And your 100th? Yeah. And better. that's what we're getting really good at. So we can build things at scale, just like the Model T in a Ford factory. How much of it is um, like machine built versus like hand built? Most is machine built. Okay. Got it. I mean, we're fabricating metal, steel, wood. We got use. It. I mean, we use equipment. Okay. I just didn't know if it was like the Model T where it's like assembly line, just freaking signs left and right. Yeah, and CNC machines and yeah. plasma cutters and lasers and all this fun stuff. Yeah. That's which crazy. I only know the words of. Yeah. I don't touch. So which, okay, now let's bring this up. I mean, which company do you think would be bigger then? We build will be bigger. We build because there's just so much opportunity with all the franchises. and Everbull will sell for more. Yeah. Because evaluations on recurring revenue stream and franchise models. We build will produce more cash on an annual basis. Mm. So we build it's going to be more profitable, just not as valuable. Correct. I won't sell we build for as much as we'll sell Everbull for, because a fran a good franchise growth company can sell for ten to twenty times recurring revenue stream. Yeah. So if you're doing fifty million dollars a year in royalty revenue and you can sell that for a half a billion or a billion dollars, yeah, that's great. If you're doing fifty million dollars in revenue at the we build level. You're not selling it for that. You're probably selling it for a hundred to a you know two to two and a half x because it's not a recurring revenue stream. Once I build it for you, unless you it's sign another done. lease, it's done. You got to keep getting client after Con client. Correct. Yeah. So it's just, but over the short term, and by short term I mean the next five to seven years. Yeah. 
WeBuild will spin off more cash yeah. that's going to go back in our pocket because same thing. I don't need to keep building a support staff and reinvest in the brand to grow it. So that cash is going to go to my shareholders. And So with a company like that, would you even want to sell it or just since it produces so much cash and it has a, not a great multiple? Would you? What do you think? Especially if you get a big exit with Everbull at that point. Like, what I do you mean, do? I... Yes, I want to sell it. Okay. You just <laughs> want to sell everything and get to the next thing. I just like, I don't like to do things for more than five to seven years. And then I want to start something else. Yeah. I love the, this phase that we're in now where we're really like, we're opening a WeBuild facility in Atlanta. We're opening a WeBuild facility in a showroom here in Vegas. Yeah. I'm meeting and working with some other big name celebrities and big name brands that I'm hoping to, to lock up over the next couple months. And this part is so exciting for me. Once it's at true scale and it's like, what am your job's done. You did what you set out to do. And I'm less valuable. I'm not the best person to be running the company. Yeah. And it's not exciting for me to just put money in my bank account that's just going to sit there. I yeah. like to be part of stuff. So selling it and getting my shareholders a return, what's been really fun is because I've done that, when I start another company, I never really struggle to raise capital if I need to. They all want to just give me yeah. a check. How much and where is it going? I like that. And I like making my shareholders money. That's fun. So being on the capital raising side, how much capital did you have to raise to get Everbowl? to where it's at today and we build yeah. where it's at today. Um, well, I started with self-funding yep. and then a local restaurant group in San Diego came to me and said, we want to invest. And so did a bunch of my friends. I kept saying no, but then finally I took their check and it was the first million from them. Plus I let other staple checks. Mm -hmm. So Everbull raised 6 million okay. over the period. And then we sold 30% of the company last year um, for at a 50 million valuation to a group. So mm. there was a nice return for my shareholders and yeah things moved on. That's awesome. Yeah. So going back to just like, as you said before, um, you like to sell, you like to start new things. And, you know, I kind of barely mentioned it in the beginning, but you know, you had sold an HR company, you had sold a marketing company that you had with Neil, Neil Patel. Like, tell me about the entrepreneurial journey of how you got to this point. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. Never okay. even knew the word, to be honest with you. It was business owners back then. Yeah. Uh, you know, the word entrepreneur is new. It's like an exciting new thing. It's glorified. But I went to law school to be a sports agent. Okay. And had a job lined up with Lee Steinberg Sports Agency. David mm. Meltzer was the president. He's my longest mentor and lifelong family friend. So funny that, you know, Dave is... I forget that that's part of Dave's story too. Yes. That, uh, you know, he, he's spoken at my events and he sat there and... Dave's just such a great guy, but I, I totally forgot he used to be in the sports world. <laughs> yeah, Dave wrote the forward of my book. I've known Dave since he was in high school. Oh, wow. Yeah, our moms are best friends. Oh. I worked and interned at Dave, all of Dave's companies while I was in middle school, high school. What, what city were you guys San in? San Diego. San Diego. His okay. mom was the principal at the school. My mom was the teacher. That's funny. Yeah. So okay. I used to go watch him play high school football. He used to come watch me play Little League, babysat me, and we were just... So how much older is he than you? Uh, 14 years. 14 years. Okay. So I was younger, but he always looked, treated me like a little... I mean, we were so close. It was like, he's yeah. my older brother. Yep. And then um, we've always had that love, 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 love brotherly relationship with a little bit of... Uh, competitiveness. Competitiveness yeah. and, and anger in between. Um, so long, long and short of it is we both wanted to be professional athletes and... I'm five nine and maybe he's five seven. So <laughs> yeah. we're, we weren't there. Yeah, um, we tried. <laughs> we tried. We tried. We gave it the good old effort. You know, I tell people that all the time. And they're like, you know, I, I tell them I was like, dude, when I was growing up, I was the freaking man in baseball. I was killing it. I was five ten, one fifty as a freshman in high school playing varsity shortstop, just picking it. And then I stopped growing. And then <laughs> you know, I was still five ten. I'm still five ten today. And you know, I, I wrote it as long as I could. I got to be an all American. I got drafted and you know, all that stuff. And then, you know, you get to the, the, the next level. And I, I just remember my first day in, um, spring training and I'm looking around and I'm like, dude, you got all these guys. They're, they're literally the best players in their college or high school over here. And they're all monsters. And then you have all these guys over here that are the best players in the world in every country you've got the dominicans the venezuelans the mexicans all these different people and we're all competing now and like i net like in college and stuff i wasn't like a small guy like everybody was you know crafty and like whatever and then you get into the pros where they draft based on like potential and they're drafting big bodied people and i'm like dang i'm gonna have to like outskill these guys if i want a chance because this is like a different level yes Yes. And, and I unfortunately 
get to answer. You know, everyone has that. Well, no, I just never got seen. Yeah. Well, I played football with Kellen Winslow Jr. And there yeah. was Steve Spurrier at my practices and all these college uh, recruiters. And they didn't, they didn't miss me. <laughs> yeah. You know, yes. I, I didn't get. You were getting seen. I was getting seen-ish. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and I played baseball competitively as well. And I played in this uh, post post high school college. I played in this li- league, and it was um, the MABL, which is a lot of ex minor leaguers okay. and, and ex college guys. And same thing. It was, I mean, Jose Canseco played it when he retired <laughs> and stuff. And um, same thing. It was like I wasn't meant to play professional sports. Yeah, I tried. But yeah, being a sports agent was like how I was going to stay connected in the sports world and match my passion for sales and sports and put it all together. So you you get your law degree. And you, you go work at an agency. No. My oh. third year of law school, I had a job lined up. Okay. And my third year of law school, met my wife and daughter and decided I didn't want to travel the world representing grownups. I wanted to <laughs> be a dad. And uh, That's I, a, like a big decision to make at a, a young age. Yeah, especially considering I just took out six figures in law school loans to do this and I never wanted to be a lawyer. Um, it was like, what am I going to do? But, you know, you have uh, choices to make in life and family is very important to me. And so I didn't want to be an absentee dad. I didn't want to have that life. You know, a lot of agents end up divorced and don't know their children. And yep. you have to make choices because your athlete has to feel like they're your everything. Otherwise, they're going to go to someone who will make them feel yep. that way. Yep. And my daughter needs to know that I'm her everything. And that was just the choice. So graduated law school and said, what do I do? I have six figures in law school loans, a fiance and a daughter, and no idea what I'm going to do with myself. <laughs> and so I got a job selling payroll for ADP. Oh. Yes. Okay. Thirty-eight thousand dollar base pay plus commission. Wow. Yeah, making it. So, what? How long did you do that for? Six months. I was uh, the number one sales rep in the country. I made Presidents Club, sold almost seven figures in payroll my first six months there, and set records at ADP. How did you learn to sell? Dave Meltzer, solution based selling, high school and college. I was telemarketer, and I spent a ton of time for Dave's interior door replacement company when I was in middle school, and then in high school I helped him with Thermoview, and um, he had a company called Corporate Connections. So and, you were just selling throughout your whole life. Yes, making friends and and helping people solve their problems with solutions I could figure out. What are your problems? I will go find a solution, and I'll figure out a way to make a little money in between. Yeah, and building relationship capital and understanding the sales cycle and the process. And so when I got the job at ADP, it was really easy because I thought differently than everyone else. Everyone else was going and knocking on doors and cold calling and business owners. And I said, you know, why would you do that when CPAs have tons of business clients? What Mm -hmm. if I just go make friends with CPAs that have all these business owners? And if I get those CPAs to say, you should use Jeff at ADP for payroll because it works seamlessly with my system, they're going to give me all the deal flow I need. Yeah. So I started making friends while everyone else was cold calling and it worked really well. And I bought a house, my first house and was getting married and I had negotiated a contract bump from 38,000 to 54,000 if I sold a certain amount. So January of 2008, I had hit that amount, went to my boss and said, do I get my raise? And they said, yeah, at the end of the fiscal year, which is in June, you'll get it come July. I'm like, no, no, no. I just bought a house. Yeah. I need the money. And I'm getting married legitimately in like six months from here. And the wedding is expensive. And they said, Jeff, these are annual goals. Like you set it in six months, but we're a big company. We, we can't do it. And it just felt like a prisoner. Like I saw this flash of my future self of like always waiting for the man to tell me when I was allowed to mm. get this next level. Right. So I went home that night distraught and I told my fiance, who's now my wife, Brittany, I said, I, I want to quit my job, sell the house, move you and my daughter. <laughs> you just into bought my, the house. <laughs> literally, we we're there for less than four months. Wow. And I want to quit the job and move you and our daughter into my parents' house and start my own payroll company. Mm. And she said, okay. So wow. I went in and said, if you don't give me my money, I quit. And they tried, my manager tried to retain me because they made a lot of money off me, but couldn't. And so I quit, sold the house, moved my, my family into my parents' house and started my very first company simply because they wouldn't give me my $17,000 base pay increase. And you, you started this other company out of spite. Out of spite. <laughs> FADP was my whole mission. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. That's really what it was. Yeah. I was like, well, I just sold all this business. I'll go back to all of them and, <laughs> and I'll take them all back with me. Then and I, I did. That, that worked. Not all, but yeah. a lot of them. I mean, I, it was very clear. I went to them and I would say, I'd be like, Ryan, listen, I, I'm starting my own payroll company. Payroll's very simple. I'll beat their price. I will. Give yeah. me their invoice. I'll cut it in half. I'll lock you in forever. You'll never have a price increase. I just need to build a base. If it doesn't work, I know everyone over there. You I'll walk back. you back over there. Yeah. I'm asking you to support me. Yeah. And a lot of people did. And nice. so it was really cool out the gates. And we started very hot, um, learned a ton about 
what actually running a company was because I knew nothing. Yeah. And failed a bunch of times in little things along the way and had a lot of fires to put out. What, what were some of those things for people? The funniest story is the very first time we ever had to run payroll. So I had sold a <laughs> bunch of clients and we couldn't figure out our payroll. We're, we're a payroll company. Well, this is actually, it gets worse. So we had about 300 checks, 250 to 300 checks. The very first Friday, it was payday. So we deliver all the checks and it's me, uh, my, one of my best friends joined me and then my wife and we're sitting in our office in San Diego and we're, we're having a celebratory moment together. Like, hey, we just delivered all our paychecks. It's Friday. Yay. And the first phone call comes in. Hey, Jeff, um, one of our employees is saying they're at the bank, but the check's not working. Yeah, like, that's weird. Must be something weird at the bank thinking it was nothing. Then the next call and the next call and the next call. Well, lo and behold, banks use this type of ink called Micro Ink, which has magnetic something in it. So you don't just print checks on your home printer. We yeah. didn't know that. So we basically <laughs> gave fraudulent checks to every single one of our of our clients the very first pay run. Uh, I spent the whole weekend delivering cash to every bank into everyone's bank accounts to make sure that they could cover right. rent and to make it right. So yeah. you learn. You learn along the way. That's so funny. What'd you say? Like when people are like, dude, why is this bouncing? What'd you say? <laughs> first, I had no idea. Yeah. Because we had no idea what magnetic ink was. Yeah. So after enough of them went, we took I took one of our own checks to the bank myself <laughs> and tried to deposit it. And the Chase Bank looked at me like, this is not a check. You realize that. I'm like, what do you mean? I printed it. And they're like, yeah. Did you use the magnetic ink? And I was like, magnetic ink? Ah, no. So I bought magnetic ink. So that's still a thing today. That I'm assuming. I mean, I yeah, sold the company we, in 2011. I haven't touched yeah, the checks. Yeah, we print all of our checks. And so they're, they're working. People are getting paid. But I just, I, I wouldn't have thought it was magnetic ink. I just look at it. And I'm like, yeah, it's just like a different type of paper. It just looks Well, it might be in official. the check stock. Did you have check stock? Like, yeah. See, we were printing the whole check. Like Got every it. word and number on the check. We didn't buy checks from like a check company. Got it. Actually, I, honestly, I have no idea how we do it. I yeah, can't even tell enough. you. <laughs> well, I know payroll. I'm not going to act like I know. I know payroll company if you need it. Yeah. yeah. So you're you guys obviously go through some bumps and bruises, and then mm -hmm. you start scaling along the way. Like, how did that go? Uh, it went really well. We started exploding out the gates and um, making friends, which is my one of my number one rule in life and core value is make friends. Number two is have fun, and so we were making friends and having fun and. Ended up deciding to really scale and grow. So we wanted to raise private equity capital. And so we did from Innovate Partners was our first PE firm to invest in us. And then another one called Claritas Capital Invest. What did you need money for? So this was 07, 08, 09. So think of how- Things were rough. And how antiquated the world was too. Like yeah. the smartphone was just coming out. Apps were starting to become relevant. Uh, relevant. And HR departments was a filing cabinet. Got it. And we wanted to build what's called an HRIS platform, a human resource information system, or think about digitizing this drawer yeah. and turning it into apps. So your employees have a portal, all the stuff you laugh about today, but think of Venmo and all this stuff. Back then. Back then. It was all by paper. So if you moved, you had like an application, people were like looking at your address and W4 forms were by paper. It was yeah. just a different world. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to turn this into a digital company and digitize the HR and payroll industry. We needed to also move upstream from, you know, three and five and 10 employee size companies to, you know, the larger brands, the thousand employees, et cetera. And so we wanted to raise capital to do that. So we opened an office also in Irvine. We had one in San Diego and Orange County. We needed to implement benefits. And we just wanted to turn this into something that was sellable and really powerful. And so that was what we needed capital for. So you guys get capital, you start scaling. Yeah. So how many years were you at that company before you sold it? So it was called iChex. And then I we checks. changed the name to Canopy HR. Okay. Um, and then we sold it in 2011 and I started it in 2008. 2008. 2008. So three years. Yeah. Just three and a half years. So what kind of revenue did you guys get to before selling? Eight figures. You guys are eight figures of revenue. And then you sold for eight figures. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you find a buyer for it? Who, who? A company called Mangrove in Florida, which was uh, in, the uh, in the space. They were just rolling us up. Got it. So they took our clients, they took our software and basically implemented it throughout. And that's very common in this industry. So they ADP were doing a roll buys up. a bunch and yep. Paychex buys a bunch. And Did they end up selling too? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> you got your check and you were like, I'm good. Well, yeah. And the thing is, I learned a lot because I also got my MBA through the School of Hard Knocks doing that. Yeah. Um, the private equity firms got most of the money because explain why, why did that happen? Yeah. So this is a, this is the learning years Yeah. or when I got my MBA. So when we started, when we raised capital, they had 30%, me and my partner had 70. Okay. Great. And we'd go and we would 
say we did a million dollars a year in revenue through yep. their guidance we spent 1.3 million or 1.4 million in expenses right and reinvestments yep so we're out of money again hey jeff this is business is going great we did four hundred thousand last year a million this year we're growing yeah let's put more money in this thing we're, we need two million more do you have your 70 percent of the two million i was 25 years old no no i don't no problem we love the business we'll put it in there'll be a dilution event okay but it makes sense because we're growing so we're like high five like that oh, <laughs> you know it's great by the way before we continue this story like for those who don't know i mean obviously the company is losing money so how were you making money was it just a salary or? correct so all you got paid was a salary during this time. What was your salary? 200. So you're making 200 grand a year, no owner's distributions because you guys are losing. Correct. So then what happens? Yeah. And so if it was up to me, we would have not been losing money because <laughs> right. on a you million dollars. Like a normal business. Yeah. On a million bucks, we should have a couple hundred grand profit here and we don't need to spend it all. Yeah. But we invested in a, in a second office we didn't think we needed and more a CTO, which was really expensive and R&D and marketing, which was you important. You were just getting really fat. Yes. Yeah. And we trusted that they're smart. I mean, they're private equity firms. They know how to utilize capital and it's their money. Yeah. So if they want to blow it, they wouldn't do that. Right. So it's smart. And we're thinking, okay, we're growing. Like this is smart. Well, when they re when they came and we needed to bring in another 2 million, we didn't have our 70% of the 2 million. So they put it all in and we went from 70% to 52%. Right. And then same thing. Then it was like, okay, Hey, we're now spending, we're making, 250 grand a month and we're spending 350 grand a month. <laughs> hey guys, do you have your 52% of the money? No, no problem. We'll put it in. <laughs> Long and short of it is we just kept getting watered down on a growing company, growing enterprise to the point where now it's time to sell and they recoup 100% of the capital plus all the profit and they own the majority of the company. And we actually didn't want to sell when we sold, but I lost control of the company during that process. So they decided to sell. To, yeah. So they were already soliciting buyers. They found the buyer and they're like, hey, we're selling. Yes. I got told actually on a day in my office, I got called in to a meeting. I'm like, yeah, sure. So I walk in and they're like, we sold the company. <laughs> oh, sh yeah. Dang. Yeah. yeah. So I learned a lot during that process. Yes, I got an exit on my belt as an entrepreneur. That's good. Yes, everyone made money. Also good. But I was very upset. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. Very upset. And so I learned at that moment the golden rule, which is, if you don't control your com your company or you have control, then you don't actually own the company. Yeah. They do. They do. They do. You're an employee at yeah, that point. At that point, I yeah. got I literally somebody else sold my company. Yeah. Which was That's interesting. That's crazy. Man. Yeah. So looking back in hindsight, I mean, obviously it all worked out and you learned a ton and everything, but like what would you have did differently? What I did with Everbull. So I have what's called I would have delineated shares differently. So there's two types of equity shares at, in my company, A and B. I'm yep. the only one with A. Got it. So if I have one, per, if I have one tenth of 1% 1 of the company, I still have 100% of the control. authority or control. And those are called preferred shares, right? For us, we just call them, uh, yeah. we call them A shares, but yeah, pref they're not preferred in, in monetary value. Yeah. So if a dollar comes in, it's split evenly amongst every shareholder. Yep. But I have the only, I'm the only voting say. So I, currently based on the, uh, the sale we had last year where we sold a stake of the company, I don't own 50% of Everbull anymore. Right. I own less. Yeah. So basically what you're, just so for everyone at home, even for myself, because I haven't had to go through this yet. I've never raised capital for um, any of our businesses, but like the way I've always heard is you've got, you know, class A and class B, like you said, or preferred and common shares. Mm -hmm. And so like the common would be the actual like distributions and money. The preferred is like the voting rights. Is that sometimes preferred could also mean a preferred return. So they yeah. get their money first. Yep. And okay. then it's distributed. But yes. Okay. Got it. So you diluted yourself like in both ways. You lost control and you lost Correct. Well, I didn't um, know about the control piece. Yeah. They were the smart money. I was just the dumb entrepreneur. So how much did they end up putting into it? Over the course they did uh just under 4 million. So basically what happened was they recouped their 4 million first. Correct. Then they had whatever percentage of the company they had, very high percentage. They got that percent of what was left over and you got Correct. the sliver essentially. Correct. What was left. Yeah. Yes. I made money. Yeah. I didn't make the amount of money I would have or should have made. Yeah. Right? Well, you would have also like ran it way less aggressive. I would have been making more money annually. Yep. 
and we who knows if I would have ever sold the company. Yeah. I mean, I think knowing me today, I would have because I liked getting the big check and yeah. I liked moving on to the next venture and realized how much fun that was. But when I went into it, the plan was never to just quickly sell it. No, no, you were, I mean, that was your first go around as an entrepreneur. Like Correct. You, you didn't even probably have a plan. Correct. I didn't. <laughs> You're just like, I'm gonna start a company out of spite. And yeah. FADP was literally yeah. on my wall. Yeah. Whatever happens, happens. Yes. So, okay. You obviously are pissed again now because you, you exit ADP pissed. Now you get your company sold from under mm -hmm. you. Um, doesn't go down the way you want. What happens next? I went home and said, well, I had started a recruiting agency on the side to help my clients because during the payroll business, it was 08, 09, and 10, the Great Recession. Everyone knows how bad the world was at that moment. We grow two ways, getting new clients and having my clients expand their employee count. Well, most of the people who were working in 08, 09, and 10 weren't changing jobs. If right. you were unemployed, the pool was enormous. If you had a job, you were holding down the fort and saying, now's not the time to switch to another company. So I had started JFEN recruiting as the as kind of a value add to my clients to say, listen, we'll help you with the recruiting side because they all seem to have this challenge. It. Yep. Um, so I ran that for about four and a half months and realized I had no desire to do that. Business. <laughs> so we sold that to Voight about four, uh, six months after I had, had left Canopy. Okay. And Canopy was gone. Um, and so I made a little bit of change with that. And so that was a little thing to get rid of. And then it was, what am I going to do next? It was 2011. My youngest was born um, of my two daughters. And I was like, you know, these computer things, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> I think I want to work from a computer. And one of my friends I grew up with, his name's Pat Flynn. He has a uh, big podcast yep. today called SPI, or Smart Passive Income. Um, back then, it wasn't so big yet. It was big, but he was showing how he made money passively online. I'm like, I yeah. want to make money he, passively online. He's like online. an OG of like podcasting, just podcasting yeah. and online making money, internet marketing. Mm -hmm. I yeah. just had him on my show uh, last week, two weeks ago, and we were just chatting about the history. Yeah, I need to get him on the show. Yeah, he's, he's one a guy I haven't connected with. I, I, if you don't know yeah. him, I can connect yeah, you. He's connect. a great dude. Yeah. Um, but I call him. I'm like, let's go to lunch. And I hadn't seen him since high school. And he's like, yeah, sure. So I go to lunch and I'm like, hey, Pat. I want to pay you 10 grand a month to teach me online passive income. <laughs> and he laughs and he's like, Jeff, the name of my website is smart passive income. I don't do that. You yeah. know, it's passive. You should talk to Neil Patel. I'm like, who's Neil Patel? <laughs> okay. And he's like, Google him. I'm like, all right. So I Google This is in 2011. Him. Yeah. Okay. So I Google him. And I'm like, oh, Neil Patel. What a badass. Yeah. You know, I want to know Neil. Yeah. So Pat connected me for an intro and, and I'm like, okay. I'm going to get Neil Patel to partner with me and we're going to go use my relationship capital and we're going to go blow this thing up. I can go sell a ton of this business because I had just done payroll for thousands of business owners that were trying to figure out how to go online better. What right? was Neil doing at this time? I mean, Neil told me his story, but I never knew both of you guys' stories converged. So what, well, where was he at? He had already co-founded Kissmetrics, Hello Bar, Crazy Egg. He had digital marketing clients with yeah. a bunch of different one-off situations. Um, Neil had his hand in a million things was speaking on stages. Yeah. He had no need for me whatsoever. <laughs> okay. All right. So he was already. Yeah. Good. No, he was a yeah. badass rock star. Yeah. I needed him. Yeah. And okay. one of the things I, I teach is the bug light concept, you know, which is something I actually learned through sports agency days and, and how you can utilize someone else's sphere of influence. If you know, sales and marketing and how to attract what's, you know, they attract the bugs and you, you zap them in a, uh, grotesque way. I, I was trying to see where you're like, I was like the bug light con. Yeah. Okay. Neil had the name power. I had the relationships and the sales power. Got it. So I could use Neil's expertise and his name value and my relationships and, and ability to sell Got it. and put something together. So Pat sets up the meeting and here's where opportunity, you know, my friends say I have fenced luck and I always say it's not luck. It's the old saying when preparation meets opportunity, right? But I have a meeting with Neil Patel. How am I going to get Neil Patel to partner with me? He doesn't know who I am. He doesn't need me. Well, I said, look, what am I really good at? I'm, I have a ton of relationship capital. I know mm -hmm. thousands of business owners that I had just done payroll and HR for for years. I know which businesses need to make money online. And I also just digitized the payroll and HR space by taking it online. So I reached out to one of my old clients and I said, listen, me and Neil are going to come in and we're going to take all your offline revenue and turn it onto online revenue. Mm. And they were doing about 50 million. This company was doing about 50 million offline and about 1.5 million online. Mm. I'm like, well, what if I can add millions of dollars to your online revenue? Don't pay me. Just let me share in the upside because yeah. this revenue is going to be cheaper for you to get. So you can afford to pay me a, a commission. Yeah. And they're like, great. 
they love the name Neil. I told him to Google Neil Patel, look how amazing he is. So they're like, done. Great. So then I get the meeting with Neil. He says, hey, nice to meet you. I'm like, nice to meet you, Neil. First thing I say to him is, where do you want me to send your check? <laughs> and he's like, for what? I'm like, I sold our first digital marketing client. And he goes, for what? And I'm like, I literally sold our first digital marketing client. I have a check for you for 150 grand. Where do you want me to send it? And he laughed and he was like taken back and no one really starts conversations with him that way. And he's like, hold on. And I said, yeah, I went and sold my client and this is who I am and this is what I have. He's like, let me fly to San Diego. Let's go meet with them. And he kind of wanted to see if I was just some crazy <laughs> just lunatic. BSing, yeah. yeah. So he comes to San Diego. He never took my check. Um, we ended up working with this clump, this company and we took him from a million five online to over 14 million online. Yeah. And we made a lot of money from it. Yep. And then we started working with big, big, big websites, gunbroker.com, which was a billion dollars a year in revenue online. Um, and the whole host of other large websites everyone knows. And I used my relationship capital and Neil partnered with me on it. And we were able to do a lot of fun things and make a bunch of money. Wow. So during this time, you were just out there hustling, selling, you know, clients on using you guys for digital marketing, right? Correct. Um, and I know Neil has obviously already had all his own. So he was still running his own ones too. And you were just like kind of using his name or how he didn't really go? have an agency. So okay. he had people that were doing services and then he would kind of cherry pick some clients that he would kind of work like one-on-one -on -one coaching with, Got it. so to speak. And I turned it into for us, which is now, you know, he's got Neil Patel Digital now, but he never wanted to have his own agency. He didn't want to deal with the sales and front end stuff. He didn't want to deal with all that client. He liked the back end. He liked, he had a team for the back end and his own knowledge. Yep. And he liked to cherry pick a few clients that he'd work with. And so I said, let's put a little water in this pipe and got let's it. utilize the fact that I have all these relationships. Let's help them. Yeah. Make them money and make ourselves money along the way. So how long did you guys do that for? Till 2015. So from 2011 to 2015, based on just what Pat Flynn told you, you're like, hey, I got to work with this guy, Neil. Well, know? Google also supported it. Yeah. Pat and Google. Pat and Google tell you you got to work with this guy, Neil. And you pitch Neil by first offering him 150 grand. Right. Right off the bat. And he's like, all right, let's go see if this guy's for real. And then you guys end up partnering for four years. Yeah. What was like... And obviously, I'm a huge fan of Neil. For those who don't know, I've, I've, there's a podcast Neil and I did. Um, we'll link to it down below so you guys can watch it after. One of my favorite episodes ever, too, by the way. And um, Neil spoke at my last Wealth Con. And so I'm obviously a big fan of Neil. Every time he speaks, sometimes I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then the other times I'm like, dude, I'd never even considered that. That's a good idea. Yes, um, he's brilliant. Yeah, like he's uh, just the way he thinks is on another level. So like during the four years working together, like my assumption is you were running the company and he was more so like, I don't want to say out of it, but like mm -hmm. st strategy and stuff. Yeah. Or out of it. He was the bug light. Yeah. It was the bug light concept. The so name. yeah, I mean, he would go do everything. And that's the beauty of it. I said, Neil, I will handle it all. I just need to, I don't have a name in this space. Yeah. Nor do I have the expertise or knowledge. I don't know anything about computers. <laughs> like seriously like when i told my wife that i was going to start a digital marketing and she goes do you even know how to use a computer yeah i'm like i'll figure it out you know like yeah we'll, we'll get there but i needed neil's expertise yeah and so the power of the bug like concept for those who are struggling to find their way in this world find what you're really good at and find what other people are really good at and see if you can partner to do really cool stuff yeah and so for i was like neil it's free money for you right like we're gonna i'm gonna get the clients you can do an analysis and say, can we add value and help them? And do we want them? Yeah. And if the answer is yes, great. If the answer is no, I'll get us another one. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I'll bring in all the big names, all the clients. Don't worry about it. And I'll handle all the billing and all the phone calls and all the stuff that you just don't frankly want to deal with. Yep. And you get to continue to keep doing what you're doing. And you're just going to keep getting checks and you have to attend a few meetings. And so he's like, yeah. Okay. Done. So Neil does this. You guys end up selling in 2015. Our clients. You guys sold your clients. Yeah, yeah. Not there wasn't a physical company to sell. It was like clients gone, client gone. This client moved here. Okay. Yes. So what does that mean? You you sold them off to another agency? Like a few different agencies would take a based on the niche. Yeah. So like if they were smaller clients, a friend of mine had a digital marketing agency and he bought a bunch of the small clients. Um, Neil Patel Digital took a couple of the bigger clients, some of the other bigger clients. We just did a, a buyout because we had long-term contract with them that was going to allow us to make a bunch of money. Yeah. And so they paid us to get out of it because uh, okay. when you, what, what I built into the contract at the time, these business owners were a little naive, but and maybe it was all shared upside. I it was shared upside in yeah. perpetuity. Yeah. Right. 
Once yeah, I get they're these, basically getting ownership in their companies. Without correct. Yeah. And they didn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> Once it got to big numbers, they're like, uh, can we pay you to get this thing out? And we're like, Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, and I've I've had a lot of digital marketers approach me with something like that. Now, I have an eye for it, obviously, so you know, nothing's in perpetuity, but I've had guys who are like, Hey, like you know, we'll share in the upside of the growth and, you know, do this kind of deal. So, yeah. And look, from my perspective, um, when, when I get pitched that, it's not a bad idea because it's like, all right, you know, if this is our revenues and you really do help us hit these numbers, then, you know, it's worth it. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I didn't even realize what I was selling when I was selling it. Right. I wasn't, ha I didn't have this idea like, oh, you know, in eight years, they're going to owe me a $10 million a year after a <laughs> hundred million, you know, yeah. forever forever. But the thought was when I was pitching, it was like, listen, we're bringing you all this new revenue. And if you're not going to pay me, I'm only getting it on the upside. You can't just turn it off once the upside's there. Yeah. Like I have to have protection, uh -huh. which makes sense. Yeah. hundred percent. And so then it became, you know, more sophisticated companies were like, how about we do a two or three year tail? Yeah. Where if we tell you no more, you'll get the money for the next two or three years. Right. And that makes sense too. Yeah. So there was a few of those, but, um, we started to sell off the ones when I say sell off, Again, they were like, hey, Buy, get bought out. They bought us out. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So at that point, was it that Neil was like, dude, this agency, agency thing is pretty cool. I should probably actually do this or what? <laughs> what happened? Well, at the time, there was a lot of younger kids coming. Instagram was getting big and, you know, Neil was speaking more. And uh, do you know Mike Camo? No. Okay. So Mike Camo runs Neil Patel Digital. Okay. And he's a great dude. And he really wanted to do like the real use Neil's name on an agency and turn this thing into a multi-billion yeah. dollar enterprise. And I had zero interest in any of <laughs> any of that. Um, we had made plenty of money and now I was ready to do something else. And so Neil Patel Digital spun up, I think about a year after we stopped. Got it. And they just kind of figured out like, hey, this was a good way to monetize. Let's keep monetizing and, and grow. And now Neil has offices all over. And yeah, and then for those who don't know Neil, follow him. He's a badass. Yeah, he's got... Um it's funny, we were just talking about it on the podcast. And truthfully, I, I didn't know like everything about him. But I was like, yeah, so how much ad spend do you guys manage? And he was like, oh, I don't know. It's like a couple billion. I was like, huh, <laughs> okay. That's yeah. a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. What's a few zeros between friends? <laughs> it's like, okay, that's a lot of ad spend. I'm like, who, who spends that much? Oh, you know, just big corporate you know, Fortune mm -hmm. 100 companies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that's a big difference between like the normal small business owner that we're going after versus this. Yes. Because being a media, you know, a digital media company for like, you know, somebody who pays you five grand a month is hard. Oh, that's very hard. Yeah. Yeah. And no, like ours, I really targeted like 30 to $50,000 a month. Yeah. And bigger. Yeah. Because it's the same amount of work. It is. And the 30 to 50,000 are less involved the three to five thousand dollar a month companies they expect you to like all of a sudden turn them into a hundred thousand overnight yeah it's like you don't have the budget for that yeah i mean you can't compete yeah and the name the neil patel name allowed us allowed me to go get them get the i wasn't going to use them to go get someone i didn't need the neil patel name for yeah that's a waste of my time and his name yeah 100 percent. Right? so it's just thinking about it more strategically but you know yeah it was just more of a hustle i mean i had started a few companies on the side that failed during that period as well so i don't want to everyone to think it's all <laughs> rainbows what, what were some of like the failure ideas uh one was called equity circle so i was trying to legalize equity-based crowdfunding back in 2012. so okay. for those who don't know crowdfunding wasn't legal back then okay to invest in a company you had to either be an accredited investor which means you have a million dollar net worth or make over a quarter million a year yep or you had to have a personal relationship with the person so i couldn't yeah. go to a thousand people and say give me a give me a thousand a hundred dollars and raise a hundred thousand dollars that way yeah that's crazy right the fact that you couldn't do that yeah and it was an old law from the 1930s to protect unsophisticated humans from being taken advantage of yeah so i had this whole idea that equity-based crowdfunding which means crowdfunding for equity, not experiences like Kickstarter where you get some cool watch, um, Got it. but you actually own a piece of the company. And we did a change.org petition. We raised hundreds of thousands of signatures and we were fighting the good fight and it passed. And we were all excited. And then I realized that my platform sucked compared to the companies that were waiting for guys like me to help legalize this thing. <laughs> and I lost and I spent a few few hundred grand of my own money to, to learn so the hard So you did way. all the hard work to get it legalized and then I was part of the group that did all the hard work. 
Okay. I don't want to tell you I was the yeah. reason it got legalized. So a few people got together to legalize this, but the people you were with already had way better products. Just companies that were sitting around knew, knowing that this was changing. Yeah. That Kickstarter was the first, but eventually equity-based crowdfunding and they were paying it. It's like um, for those who follow Bitcoin, right? Like yeah. this whole legalization of an ETF on yep. spot Bitcoin, BlackRock's doing this. And those who are paying attention might realize like it's a matter of when, not if. Yeah. And so what are we going to do to be prepared? Well, I was fighting to legalize, thinking my platform, I was the only one who had this idea. So my platform was going to be the only, and it was going to be great. It wasn't, and <laughs> it sucked, and I lost a bunch of money. But I learned. Yeah. Right? I learned that dying for the cause is not the way to go. Right. Have a business. And then I also had a company called uh, Sports Investing Systems. Uh, a friend of mine built this algorithm, which could help. It was based on back testing and math, but the, the unsexy way of saying it is sports betting. And there was a system and a model that worked if you back tested it for 30 years in the NFL. That if these things hit, this was the bet and it always worked. Mm. Um, and so I, stole, I sold a subscription online. But the problem was I didn't really understand how to market myself online and I really didn't want to be a marketer online. And I was trying to grow the Neil Patel thing and I wanted to be incognito on the sports investing okay. thing. And it just didn't fit right. Yeah. Um, so that was, a, that was a, another one that just petered out pretty quickly what do you think about when people would say well dude i mean trying to do a lot of things all at once is just you're gonna fail i don't know that that's true because i think the mistake people make is they don't realize that all businesses are the same yeah that's when i started everbowl i went out to dinner with my parents and my wife and i said i'm gonna start this restaurant chain and i i use this i say this because it's funny but it's true and my dad said are you nuts nine out of ten restaurants fail Mm. And my mom said, you don't know how to cook. <laughs> and my wife said, all you do in a kitchen is eat and make a mess. Yeah. And all are true. But why do nine out of 10 restaurants fail? Because they're started by chefs. Yeah, not business people. Not business people. So whether it's a restaurant, a digital marketing agency, a payroll business, a construction company, business underlying business is the same. Business is business. Business is business. So whether I have five departments in my business or I have five companies that do completely different things, the core business is the same. And while I do a lot of stuff, I use a concept called vertical integration. My construction company started to build Everbull. Yeah. Unevolved Products, my product manufacturing company, where we sell product on QVC and I sell product to all my stores and I sell direct to consumer, that's to provide product to my main restaurant. Yeah. Unevolved Studios, the studio was built to create content for Everbull. Now I have shows and I have this other stuff from it. We build does all these other concepts and Unevolved Products does all these other stuff, but it started with the core prop, uh, purpose of helping my main thing. Mm -hmm. So while it sounds like I'm a scatterbrain doing a billion different things, there is a, there is a picture on the wall. If you stand back, you can see how they all are vertically integrated and connected very much like McDonald's has large chicken farms and is the largest toy ma uh, manufacturer and distributor because of the happy meal. And they mm. have cattle farms and they have they got real, the estate, real estate, right? <laughs> yep. Now, are they just crazy? No, they, they're vertically integrated. They're building something. Yeah. No, I've always said that too. You know, every business I've started, had in some form or shape um, supported what I was already doing, right? So, you know, I got started flipping houses and that was how I had my first million bucks. And then, you know, people were like, teach us how to flip houses. So we started education. Then people wanted their tax work done. So we started tax work. Then I started doing the social media thing and people were like, teach us social media. So we do a social media thing. Then they're like, dude, we need people to edit our videos and do all this stuff. And I'm like, so we start Pineda Media. And so... Yeah, I mean, they all came from, they weren't like random things where I'm like, I wonder if this will work or not. It was like, they were already things people wanted that were already customers or students or whatever. And many of them are things that just have to get done regardless. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very and, similar. And why thing. outsource? Yeah. Like if this is how I explain vertical integration. If you have a repeatable problem, for me, it was building Everables. Yeah. I'm going to have to build a hundred of them. I can go hire a hundred GCs around the country and teach them how to build an Everwell and hope they make it right and what stains and what, et cetera. Or I just do it for myself. Mm -hmm. Start their own company, right? Unevolved products. I'm importing superfoods from around the world. I can pay these importers and I can find companies that can do it or I can fly to Brazil directly with the factory and start importing my own. Yeah. It's just like you need tax work for your own real estate and all the things you're doing. So to have your firm and you have customers asking you for it, yep. help them. Yep. You can refer to me or yeah. you can start your own. That's the way I always looked at it with all these things. So no, hundred percent on board with that. So you and Neil, um, end up 
selling off all the clients and everything else. And then what happens? Semi-retired, driving my wife and kids crazy. And my wife said, go do something. You're driving us crazy. <laughs> no, um, I'm just too high strung to sit at home. You know, uh, I was 32 years or 33, 32, 33. And that's the birth of Everbull. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go do something. I just, I don't care about the money. I just want to go do something I'm passionate about and leave a nice impact. And I didn't think I was going to start we building all these other brands from it. I just thought I was going to have a. But like, I guess what like acai bowls like did you see one you're like dude this would be a good concept like how did that happen so i'm a hypochondriac which means i'm afraid of disease okay so i've always been how do i stay healthy how do i how do i how do i and google is the worst thing you could possibly have and give me in my pockets even worse yeah they they what do they say like all doctors there, there's some symptom that doctors get where they start or no they're students in medical school they're like research a disease and then they'll start to think they have the <laughs> disease and stuff i have that problem yeah i get every disease twice <laughs> right once in my head and then once after i read about it in google i'm like i actually have that yeah that sounds right yeah that's my problem and the danger with google is everything on google is cancer yeah you have headaches it's cancer yep you stub your toe and your toe throbs for more than two days, it's cancer. Yeah. And so you start to fear cancer. And so it's like, well, how do you avoid cancer? Well, you, the easiest thing to do is to prevent, it's easier to prevent illness than cure it. Right. And so then I was like, well, how do I prevent illness? So I started researching nutrition and lifestyle. This was 15 years ago. And I came across acai bowls in 2009 or 10. They were, I didn't even know they were a thing back then. Well, there was a, <laughs> they weren't popular, but there no. was a few places where you could get them and, um, yeah. I had had one. I'm like, this is really good. And acai, high in antioxidants, keeps you young, prevents yeah. this, does great. So I started just importing it into my house and I was just eating it at home, making it on the side just as a thing. And yeah, friends would come over. I'm like, try this. I'm like, oh, this is really good. Try this really good. So before Everbowl, actually, I was going to start, I was starting this company called Logo Car. Logo Car. Yep. I own the domain logocar.com. So what do you do? Well, it's like it, a race car. It's basically what you think about. Uh, you heard of Rapify? No. Okay. So rap, basically we'd pay people to let us put other brands logos on their cars. So instead yep. of having billboards, let me billboard your car. Yep. Cause there's a lot of Honda civics and Toyota Corollas and you know, cheaper cars that people need income and they have a car. So let's monetize that payment for you. Why should you charge all, you know, maybe you're not going to let me put on your Mercedes or your Ferrari, but the lower end price cars struggling into families. Let me put some logos on your car of local businesses. Yep. Again, I have all these business owners. Out, 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 out of uh, offline media and billboards get a lot of money. So you think about how many eyeballs go on vehicles and we're like, NASCAR proved it. I mean, <laughs> you could throw logos on cars. So the idea was logo car. And then we were eventually going to take it to digitization where let me put screens on your car. And then based on where your car was, ads would hit from businesses in that geographic region. And I had this whole idea. They, they do that in Vegas now where they got the freaking cars with the giant screens on them. They do. But this was 20, this at this time was end of 2015. Right. So I was going to start Logo Car. So I had a buddy of mine who was do, helping me with the branding and we went out and I purposely took him to this restaurant that had an acai bowl because I wanted him to just try it from not from my house, but like someone else's. And while we're eating it, he's a very picky eater. And while we're eating it, he's like, this is really good. <laughs> like If he likes this, this is a real business. So I was like, great. I'm going to start Logo Car in the back of an Everbowl okay. because I didn't want to get an office. So I was like, I'll monetize my office by building my first restaurant. Yep. And in the back, I'll have logo car in my consulting business and I'll just work from the back and I'll make some money and not have to pay just for an office space. Well, the business Everbowl took off so fast that logo car died and I just ended up scaling and growing Everbowl. Mm. So, I mean, Everbowl was self-funded to begin with. Yes. Right? What, why did it take off so fast? What did you do to get such a, a good start? People just really liked it. Acai bowls are a thing. Yeah. Uh, there just wasn't. There wasn't a lot of competition. There was none. Yeah. So I was able to, people like, oh, this is really good. And I knew nothing about how to drive traffic to a restaurant. I right. knew nothing about That's restaurants. That's what I was thinking about. I mean, you came from the digital marketing, so you would think you could yeah. run ads to it and whatever. I still don't know how to do digital marketing. <laughs> You're just a sales I would guy. need to call Neil. Um, but what I did was I gave away free food. I had a party. Got it. And I said, you know what? Tell the entire community, free bowls, come to Everbowl. We had lines around the block. Huh. It's amazing how long people will stand in line for a seven, eight dollar bowl. It's crazy. I mean, seriously, because <laughs> I wouldn't. So a uh, quick story. I was uh, driving by Costco and dude, the line for the gas was like astronomically long. I was, uh, I just looked at my wife and I was like, these people are so dumb. They just don't know what their time is worth. Like to go sit in line for 30 minutes to save 
a couple of dollars. They're, they're just saying their time is worth like five bucks an hour. And she's like, yeah, that would be a good TikTok." <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, man, you're right. I don't, I don't want to make it, but I'm going to go make it. So I flipped a U, went into Costco. And I was like, guys, if you're one of these people sitting in line, you do not value your time. Like straight up, you're telling me your time is worth $5 an hour. And, um, people were pissed. They were like, <laughs> they're like, Costco gas is the best. That line doesn't take that long. It's quick. It's efficient. You know, I go in the morning to get my Costco gas before everyone. And I'm just, I'm still in my mind. I'm like, you're still kind of missing the point. Like if you have to go way out of your way to go save a couple of dollars at Costco, you, you're probably better off just going to the nearest gas station, even if it's the highest price, if, if you value your time. So my dad is a Costco gas. Yeah. He, he, and my dad's, very well off. He's a retired doctor. He yeah. made a bunch of money. Yeah. And I give him a ton of, I give him such a hard time because I'm like, dad, you drive an extra four miles to a Costco. <laughs> exactly. You're wasting the money on gas. Yeah. And time. Time. Well, forget the, he's retired. So he maybe has the time, but I'm like the money you think you're saving, you would have, you used it in gas to get to the Costco. Yeah. You passed 14 gas stations. <laughs> yeah. But to save that 28 cents a gallon. <laughs> and you have to pay Costco a hundred bucks a year or whatever. <laughs> Correct. To go yeah. to even get the right. I don't get it. I mean, I think Costco gas is fine. If I'm in Costco and there's no line and I need gas, great. But I'm I get ex- gas. I'm extreme. I haven't walked in a grocery store in years. I'm like, nope, just freaking Uber it here, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's not worth my time. Yep. But t- time is the most important facet we have. Yeah. And you're right. We A lot of us do not understand what our time is worth no not at all and that's why a lot of people don't have the level of success that they want as part of the success formula that if you understand that you can start to utilize it and there's a difference between being product productive and active and i talk about this a ton a lot of times people are active and they think oh i'm doing all these things look how busy i am no you're busy you're not being strategically productive yeah right sitting in line at a costco to save the five bucks you can say look i save five bucks is not smart no Go to the other gas station and then use that time to get yourself ahead. Yeah. Maybe you make six bucks. So people are waiting for like hours to get their free $8 bowl. Yes, hours. <laughs> they still do. Every new Everbowl we open, we give away free bowls. You do bowls. the same thing. That's the, it's our new thing. It's called friends and family. Have a party in the how, community. Like for one day or how long? Yeah, opening day. Opening day, everything's free. Well, we open at like four o'clock that day and we go till we go. Yeah. So it's And then that's how you hours. get everyone hooked on the product. Well, now you've had it. Yeah. So like, now I don't have great. to convince you to try it. Oh, does it good? You know if it's good. You yeah. ate it. That is a great marketing campaign. It's easy. I'm going to do that. You should. I was, uh, what's it called? I, I was watching the Flamin' Hot Cheetos movie. Did you watch that? Uh-huh. Yeah. And they that's what they did. They're like, why is no one buying the Flamin' Hots? It's so good. And he's like, we're just going like how we always do this. We're going straight to the community, just handing out bags yes. to everyone. Well, it's, you figure out really quickly, right? To your point of what do your customers want? If they don't like it, I'm going to know. You're going to fail. If, if you can't give them away, you're done. And, and better <laughs> to fail day one. Yeah. Then, why keep going? Yeah, keep thinking, man, why is this not working? Because I can turn Everbowl into something else. If it's not, if they didn't like acai bowls, Everbowl would be a poke bowl place. Or yeah. it would be a cereal bowl place. Yeah. Or a soup bowl place. Something with a bowl. Or then I would turn the name away from Everbowl and come up with a new brand. Or you're, you're going into smoothie world. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Taking all the fruit and instead of putting it in a bowl, you're like, I'm putting it in the blender. Yes. I mean, when you go simple, right? Business isn't as hard as we all make it out to be. Right. We just overcomplicate it. Yeah. And everyone has this bad habit of trying to do it the way everyone else does it. Yeah. And if you want to be like everyone else, then do it like everyone else and you're going to be average because that's unfortunately, no matter how good or bad everyone does it, average is the average of everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So stand out and try it a little different. Yeah. So I've never like eaten a full acai bowl because I look at it like a dessert. I'm just like, dude, this is just like all sugar and there's no protein. And I'm like, I don't see how this bowl is actually good for me. So what do you say to the skeptics like me? Well, number one, I say (laughs) it's not all sugar. It's fruit. It's sugar from fruit. Yeah. And your body doesn't have the same reaction to it. I mean, this is, again, science, but um, you don't have an insulin spike when you eat an apple. Okay. Because there's fiber in the apple. If you drink apple juice, you have an insulin spike because you're just getting straight sugar. Right. Um, So your body knows how to process it. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Okay. Number two, yes, you want protein, but you don't need to have protein with every single thing you put in your mouth. 
Right. Right. Like that's a little, that is an extreme perspective. Yeah. Like yeah. must have protein. I'm just, I just have to have protein in every like meal or snack. Why? I'm just trying to hit my freaking 200 grams a day. That's all. Why do you think you need 200 grams a day? That's just what I've always done. And it's, it's made me healthy. And when I look at like just being an athlete, mm -hmm. that's what they've always told us. Um, I also think like the studies are showing that having muscle is like one of the reasons you're able to, you know, avoid injury and have longevity. Like muscle is like the number one factor. I mean, I, I have muscle. Yeah. I don't have protein with every meal. How many grams do you eat a day? 100 to 150. Okay. So I weigh 185 pounds. Okay. So you're not eating a ton of protein. I, I eat when, if me and you go out for lunch and I eat, I eat protein with most of my meals. Yeah. But I even also eat bull every day. Yeah. It's just what I, what I think what I, I want to make sure I also do is I want to get all my vitamins and my micro macronutrients and I want to have the best of it all. So yes, I'm going to eat a lot of protein. I'm not suggesting you don't eat a lot of protein. Yeah. I just don't think, I don't think you'll, you would see a huge decline in anything if at all, if you went from 200 grams of protein to 150. Right. You know, or yeah, 100, 150 is still a lot. It's still plenty. Or if you, uh, you won't notice. Yeah. I mean, I work out a lot. Um, I work out every day. Yeah. I'm doing this uh, rich from my buddy, rich who's the CEO of EOS fitness had challenged me to work out first one, not to work out loses. And we have to wear these things. And so it's like a competition. Yeah. And it's tough every day. Yeah. Come hell or high water. It's every day. Yeah. And I don't eat, I mean, I eat protein for sure, but I intermittent fast. So I don't eat my first meal till two o'clock. Right. And then I drink coffee all day and water. And then, yeah, I'll have, Oh, you so you eat just one meal a day. No, I eat more than one. I won't. I'm saying I drink coffee and water till two. Yeah. Then yeah. I eat between two and eight usually. So you'll eat like two meals a day. Two big meals and an yeah, acai. Maybe bowl. a snack. Oh, the acai bowl is the yes. snack. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Now for a lot of people, it's a, it's a meal. Yeah. But to answer your question, yes, there is sugar in acai bowls. Yeah. Um, but you would die without sugar. Mm. You need sugar to live. Your brain runs on glucose. Mm. So you can't go completely sugarless. Right. Can't. Right. Uh, Meat doesn't have sugar, right? Meat, I don't think meat has sugar. Okay. Unless it's got the, the marinade. <laughs> right. The sauces Barbecue. probably do. Yeah. The the marinades, the seasonings, the spices. Yeah. Um, but glucose is important. Yeah. Right? That's why even there, I think there's even glucose in uh, IV bags. Hmm. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Quo don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure. Okay. Don't start put, getting an IV bag for that glucose rush. But, um, you know, I would just say to you that, don't set yourself with these limiting beliefs. Mm. You know, yes, the Breccas of the world will tell you one thing. And yes, the um, Avocado Wolf is his name, not Avocado King. Okay. Avocado he Wolf. He should be Avocado King. He should be. I'll, I'll, I'm going to look up But I think Avocado his last name's King. Wolf. Okay. Um, or Avocado David, Wolf, yeah. David Avocado Wolf. We I think make it's David it. Avocado Wolf. That might right, be his I'm going to search him yeah. out for this. Anyway, he's like the, he's the Brecca of don't eat it if it's cooked. Okay. Only vegetables. And... Oh, so he wants raw, just raw, 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 straight out the ground. Yes, and I think that that's wrong too. When you look <laughs> at when you look at him, he looks frail. When you yeah. look at when you look at the Brecas, they look ripped. And I guess that's where my point comes from. Is like when I look at at least one end of the spectrum of of vegans, most of them don't look how I want to look. And then if I look at the carnivores, they're definitely better. they look better. Yeah, just will they live as long? That's time that's, will tell. Time will tell, and that, that, that's the challenge. And so. I trust science a lot. Yeah. I think scientists are smart, right? They're doing this research stuff. So, you know, do I know it all? I don't, but I do know that if the guy at Harvard, David Sinclair is telling me to eat more plants, I'm going to eat more plants, but I'm not going to, I don't want to look like that. So David Sinclair, is he only a plant-based guy? No, but oh. predominantly okay. eats fish. Um, but he try he, but he has like what he has found in labs with different primates and mice. And, you know, so, um, like I started taking metformin. I don't which know what that is. it's a diabetes drug. Okay. And it's now a longevity thing that's coming out. So there's this guy I saw on Twitter the other day. I think his name's like Brian Johnson or something. You ever seen this guy? I don't know. It's a very generic name. I know he, <laughs> uh, look him up. Cause he's like, he sold a company and then he started something called like the blueprint. Okay. And he's, he's taking like a hundred pills a day. He's plant-based. He's doing like all these experiments on his body. And like, I guess this claim to fame was that he did his like cry. I don't know his age, whatever, like his yeah. body's age was. And it came out to be like 18 years old when he's really like in his fifties, I think. 
Um, That's a growing thing. So David Sinclair and I don't own any stock in this company, but he has a company called Tally Health okay. that does that. Okay. So, so I do it. Okay. So they'll give you like your body's age. Yes. Your biological age. Your biological age. Yes. And how did yours come back? So when I first took it, I was a year older than I really was. Okay. So not good. Not, not where I wanted to be. Well, it's actually, it's normal probably. Probably. Yeah. But not where I wanted to be. Right. And then they have a supplement, but it's like longevity stuff, like uh, Reservatrol, but in high doses and a bunch of stuff. And I started taking it and following, changed my lifestyle a little bit. And now I'm a few years younger than I really am. So I think the last time I got it tested, I was like 36. Perfect. And I'm 40. Okay. So I'm getting younger. So with those guys and with what you're doing at Everbowl, like how much do you think that focusing more on your health has like made you better as a business owner, as an entrepreneur and everything. It's a hundred percent. Yeah. It's that's why I started ever. That's my passion because when you aren't healthy, like we think about our vehicles. If I went to your car and I tried to put yellow six in your car, you'd beat me up or call the police. Mm -hmm. Like this guy's ruining my car, uh -huh. but we put few, bad fuel in our bodies every day. Yeah. And we don't move our bodies. And so we feel lousy. We sleep lousy. And therefore, how do we perform? Our minds are foggy. We have aches and pains. We don't feel good. I wake up at 4 to 5.30 in the morning without an alarm clock, ready to charge the day. I go hard all day. Yep. I juggle companies. I have two kids, a wife, et cetera. I go home. I spend time with my family. I go to bed. I feel yep. great. Yep. I don't have these complaints. Do you drink at all? Very, very infrequently. Yep. Um, I'm not a drinker. Yeah. Not for any, I'm not a recovering alcoholic or I don't have any. It's just not good for your body. You just. I just don't see the need. See, yeah. I don't, I don't. But you like it. coffee. I love coffee. Okay. It's a longevity. Lo coffee's for longevity. Yes. You know, I've seen like them saying wine does that too. Uh, Reservatrol does. That's what's in wine. Okay. So yes, there's a, there's a component of red grapes called Reservatrol. Got it. Which in, now here's the thing, like all <laughs> marketing and you're a marketer, so you'll yeah. understand. Reservatrol in very high doses has increased longevity. Okay. One glass of wine doesn't do anything but get you a little buzz. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, yes. Drink more red wine. You know how much wine you'd have to drink? A lot. A, a bottle. Lot. Yeah. So, dude, you know what's funny is like every time I see these studies by this doctor, that doctor, and then like, you know, you do the, not the conspiracy theories, but you just look and you're like, oh, well, yeah, that company funded this. This company funded this. Of course, of course this was the outcome. Yes. It would have never got published if it wasn't. Yes, exactly. I mean, you got to take it for what it really is. Like It's read, all marketing. It's all marketing. Yeah. Read the actual study. If you really want to know, read the study. Yeah. Like the actual study. And you'll be like, oh, that amount of Reservatrol equals 14 bottles of red wine. All right, <laughs> go drink that today. That's why I'm like, I don't know what to believe. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's just everybody's study is already usually coming from a biased, like, thing we're trying to hit yes and if we can if we can prove our theory then great if we can't throw that study away no one needs to know about it let's just keep trying new studies i mean it's true yeah it's true and it's it's tough i mean that's kind of where i'm in the middle that's why i i think that there's merit to eating i look at i try to go down to its core its simplest form right like whatever the simplest answer is is usually the right one right our teeth tell us what we should eat i mean we have predominantly teeth that is the same as animal based or plant based animals right. that forage on plants. Got we it. only have two uh, carnivorous teeth, our fangs, you know, which yeah. imply we do need to eat protein. Yep. So, and you think about cavemen, like we, they all talk about cavemen diets, but cavemen ate plants as the staple of their diet. The, the paleo diet. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what did we eat before we had anything was mostly plant based because that's all they could get because it's hard to kill an animal. Yeah. And we had no fridges and freezers. So once you killed it, you yeah. ate it for a day or two and then it's back done. to foraging. So try to eat that way because that's what we were doing before we got in our own way and mm. figured it out, you know? You know what I want to do is on one of my next podcasts, I want to get the freaking avocado wolf on one yes. side and I want to get liver king on the other. I want to just see it duped out. You should put, you should, <laughs> the loser has to eat the other ones. Yeah. That so would like be great. put a steak and yep. a big salad. I'll, and I'll just be eating it as I host, and I'll be like, I like him both guys. For I'm, every good I'm, point, I'm take a bite from either yeah. side. That he brings up a good point. Yeah, that's a piece of broccoli for that. <laughs> okay, that's a good point. I'm eating the wagyu. Yeah. right now. That'd be a fun episode. That would. I'm gonna freaking. I'm gonna make it happen. That'd be a fun episode. Well, bro, um, I think it's super cool what you're doing, man. I love serial entrepreneurs. I mean, obviously, I've I can't help myself either. I, the thought of doing the same thing over and over again for a long time is very difficult. Um, so as much as, 
you know, I love, you know, I guess like you, you know, you go through seasons of entrepreneurship and you're like, man, this is what I'm passionate about. I built it. Now what? And then, you know, it's, it, it's cool that you found this big passion with Everbowl and then it's going to be exciting to see what happens after that too. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that's right. Guys, um, if you haven't tried an acai bowl, go try it. I'm actually, you know what? I'm going to eat, eat a full one from Everbowl just to just say I've eaten one and then let's see how I feel after. You'll be hooked. Oh, I'm going to be hooked. 10 episodes from now, he's going to come in. You're going to be seeing him eating an acai bowl from yeah. Everbowl on camera. Yeah, I'm like, who's the guest again? Let me finish this bowl. Yes. But I guess Everbowl is probably better than the Panda Express I've been eating like every day. It's a little better. <laughs> Dude, a I've crushed Panda for years. And uh, what do you, what's your go-to? Half veggies, half fried rice, teriyaki chicken, Kung Pao chicken. And, um, I, you know, it's a variety, the last one, but I've been going with the Angus steak okay. lately. So no, you don't use no orange chicken. No, I know that's bad for me. Okay. I, right. the, the orange chicken I know is not really chicken. It's, Do you ever get the chicken with mushrooms? Um, Not really. Okay. That one looks okay. It's good. Honestly, I judge it all by the protein. I'm like, okay, teriyaki chicken's got the most. Steak's got the second most. And then the Kung Pao is just delicious. Well, we have a new product that has protein. It's called an Everwitch. Oh, okay. What's in it? It's I reinvented the ice cream cookie sandwich. So it's granola cookie. Our base, granola cooking, we have different flavors, not just acai. One of our bases is vanilla. And in it is four grams of protein. Four grams? That's not even protein. Hey, but it's a snack. <laughs> it's a snack. It's but got protein do, in it. I did eat an ice cream sandwich yesterday. And how much protein was in that? Probably the same. Zero. <laughs> yeah. So, well, maybe a little bit. Milk has protein. There's some milk. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. So maybe four. And the cookie probably has a little... You know what? That that ice cream sandwich probably had about 10. No way. I bet. Pepsi challenge. <laughs> I'm going to look it up. Cut. Ice cream sandwiches. How many they got? Yeah. But anyways, dude, it was great finally meeting you in person, man. I'm excited to see what you do. Guys, go follow Jeff and make sure you guys go try an Everbowl. And man, we'll have to do it again sometime. Yes. You'll have to come out to San Diego. Come on my show. Yep. And I'm sure we'll be uh, speaking on some stage together here pretty quick. Yep. We'll make it's it great happen. to finally meet you in person. Thanks for having me. You too. Guys, make sure you subscribe. We'll catch you on the next one. Peace. The more pain that you can get the prospect to feel, the more they want to change. I have got what Inc. calls the number one fastest growing sales company in the world. The unique use of behavioral science and human psychology. The sales world has already transformed. We need to catch up. 3x, 5x, even 10x their sales results. His training has transformed everything. Most salespeople have been